Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for Understanding the Many Paths to Menopause, which is part of SWHR's Menopause Mindfulness webinar series. I'm Katie Schubert. I'm president and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research, which is the thought leader in promoting research on biological sex differences in disease and improving women's health through science, policy, and education. Approximately 1.3 million women in the United States transition into menopause each year. SWHR's Menopause Mindfulness Series was created to increase awareness about the impact of menopause on women's health. And these events discuss how to improve health outcomes through recognizing and addressing symptoms, comorbidities, treatment options, and barriers to accessing quality care, while highlighting the diverse experiences of women during and after the menopause transition. And we are pleased today to have two amazing panelists joining us, Karen Giblin, founder and president of Red Hot Mamas, and Pamela Price, deputy director of the Bomb and Gilead. I'd also like to thank the sponsors of today's event, Astellas Pharma and Pfizer. And as always, we are live tweeting this event, and we invite you to join in and use the hashtag SWHRTalksMenopause on all social media. And with that, I will go ahead and introduce Dr. Irene Aninye, SWHR's Chief Science Officer, who is moderating today's event. Thank you, Katie, and welcome, everyone. Many women experience a typical menopause, developing symptoms, and the end of menstruation in their late 40s or 50s. The average age of menopause in the United States is 51. Early menopause is when a woman enters menopause in her early 40s, and if it is before age 40, it's referred to as premature menopause. Not all paths to menopause are the same, and the cause of menopause may affect a woman's symptoms and her treatment. There are a number of reasons a woman may experience menopause early. For example, genetic factors can influence ovarian function, as well as certain autoimmune disorders. Medical procedures such as chemotherapy or surgeries that damage or remove the ovaries can also cause premature or early menopause. SWHR's menopause program was established to draw awareness to research gaps in unmet needs in clinical care, education, and policy concerning menopause and its impact on women's health. We've assembled a working group of researchers and healthcare providers with expertise in gynecologic health and mid -health in midlife care, patients and patient advocates, and healthcare decision makers who are committed to improving care for women through midlife and menopause. Today, we have two members of our working group with us to continue our menopause mindfulness series, understanding the many paths to menopause. These women will share their menopause transition experience, each unique, but hopefully providing insight for those of you watching as to how you might navigate your menopause transition or support other women during theirs. Following their presentations, we will have a panel discussion and invite those of you who are tuned in live to submit questions using the Q&A function throughout the event. I'll now introduce Karen Giblin, who will share about her path to early menopause and how she navigated the transition. Thanks for joining us, Karen. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'd like to introduce myself. Um, next slide, please. I am the founder of the Red Hot Mamas Menopause Education Programs. I'm also the editor in chief of our newsletter, free e newsletter that goes out to thousands of women each month, and it's called the Menopause Minute. I'm co author of two books on menopause the Manual of Management Counseling for the Perimenopausal and Menopausal Patient, and Eat to Defeat Menopause. I've conducted research through the Red Hot Mamas programs and presented it at numerous um, conferences, medical conferences. I'm the member, of, I'm a longtime member of the North American Menopause Society and the International Menopause Society. And I've actually held public office and served as selectman for the town of Ridgefield, Connecticut for three terms, that's six years. Next slide, please. And I'd like to, um, you know, there are, share my story. Okay, and as I have on here, one woman's experience is not every woman's experience. So I'll, I'll just briefly go over my story. 
Um, there are many reasons why women may uh, be recommended by our doctor to have a hysterectomy. And my reasons were to correct some serious health problems that was interfering with my life. Some of my gynecological concerns were, um, and this is why I had to have a hysterectomy, ovarectomy, were heavy menstrual bleeding. And that was due to a blood clotting disorder called von Willebrand's disease. And I, because of the heavy menstrual bleeding, I also uh, developed anemia. I had uh, chronic pa pa pelvic pain due to ovarian cysts and endometriosis. And, the, and I also had ovarian cyst ruptures, which caused me to have to have them removed. And in addition, I had the en endometriosis where the endometrial tissue inside the lining of the uterus grew outside of my uterus and onto the nearby organs. And this caused a lot of abnormal vaginal bleeding and pain to, for me. Next slide, please. So my doctor, uh, my gynecologist recommended a hysterectomy, a uh, which is the removal of my ovaries. And she recommended that that would be the best option for me to get to, re to return back to good health. Uh, and I was certainly, when she recommended this operation, uncertain about having it. So I went and had second and third opinions from gynecologists and they all produced the same recommendations. So, and at age 40, um, I decided after weighing all my options that a hysterectomy, ovarectomy was the best option uh, to eliminate my gynecological problems. Well, things went pretty fast forward and I was suddenly in the hospital having an abdominal hysterectomy and ovarectomy. And well, voila, my menopause occurred very abruptly right after my surgery. And that sudden loss of hormones really resulted in severe menopausal symptoms. Next slide, please. Well, the, well the, you can go back again, I'm sorry. I wanna talk, talk more about my symptoms because I, I feel as if my symptoms were very, very problematic for me. And I had what I called the devilish duo, okay? The hot flashes, the night sweats, okay? That's the devilish duo for me. Heart palpitations, uh, trouble sleeping, fatigue, I was tired, uh, irritability, and I had major forgetfulness due to my symptoms. And I felt really ignorant at the time because I really did not prepare myself with adequate information beforehand in order to cope with the symptoms that I was experiencing or, or cope with the recovery period that caught me off guard. This all occurred, okay, as I mentioned to you before, uh, while I was serving public office in 1991 as selectman in my town of Ridgefield, Connecticut. And to complicate things even more, at that time, that this was now 1991, there were no um, how to do menopause books out there. And, or, and so I did not know how or wh where to go to have an explanation and how to deal with my symptoms. And I really needed answers. Next slide, please. So because I was an elected official, okay, uh, many women knew me in my local community, and I began receiving calls from a multitude of women uh, in my community. And these women were asking questions about their natural menopause, their surgical menopause. And I knew then that, you know, I, I had a realization that thing it came into my mind, there's got to be a better way to educate women and to get answers. So brick by brick, I um, began laying the groundwork to remove the mystery about menopause, by, and I created the Red Hot Mamas Menopause Education Program. And I did this to help women understand what to expect when menopause arrives and how to manage its course. Um, I guess you're wondering, okay, Red Hot Mamas, where did she get that from? Well, because I was so symptomatic and my young daughter used to see me having hot flashes all the time. She used to say, you're a Red Hot Mama. So I thought that was apropos and that's how the program got its name. Next slide, please. So 
the, some of the advice uh, today that I'd like to give a whim, woman about hysterectomy from my own experiences, that hi, it, hysterectomy is often the right answer, um, but it shouldn't really be taken lightly. If you're told uh, that you have need a hysterectomy, it's very important that you discuss your concerns and don't hesitate to ask your doctor questions. Um, I, I would suggest preparing the list of questions before you even go to your doctor and include questions about, you know, what type of hysterectomy that he or she recommends to you, what are the treatments, what are alternative options, what are the side effects, and again, I always say, you know, always get a second opinion. And going, and the other thing that I recommend, okay, that caught me off guard was the recovery period. I suggest that you be, pre be prepared when you go home to rest a lot. Um, if you have to take naps, uh, you know, you do so. And if you have to turn your phone off and not, not have guests come to your house while you're recuperating, that might be a good idea because you, you're going to feel overwhelmingly fatigued for a first few weeks. And it's very important to really add activities gradually and pay attention to your body and the way it responds to any of the tasks that you perform and really give yourself enough time, ample time to heal and always listen to your body and, and what it's trying to tell you. So just be prepared to, for that recovery and be, be prepared to rest. Next slide, please. And again, here's some more of my words of wisdom. Okay, uh, I like to tell you that menopause is not a disease. It's a normal event that happens in every woman's life. Okay, but there are again, different pathways that we experience and go into menopause. And it's very important that women educate themselves. Okay, and I always say to take charge of of menopause before it takes charge of you. So I'd like to also state that it's very important to bring up, change your attitude and have, because your attitude about menopause, okay, can really impact your experience of it. In fact, you know, many women even experience a newfound sense of freedom and personal growth, okay? And personally, I've, I've um, always thought that it's important to honor thy humor at menopause, okay? After all, there's no, there's no prescription required to get a good laugh. So I always tell my, I always try to keep a twinkle in my wrinkles, okay? And I, part of this is, you know, I was, I was happy to toss out those tampons because I really hated them anyway. So I suggest that you keep the twinkle in your wrinkle and make menopause the best years of your life. Next slide. And if you want any more information about the Red Hot Mamas, we have a website, redhotmamas.org, our medical advisory board, uh, answers questions if women write, write to us through Red Hot Mamas. Again, we have the newsletter and we also, it's very important to connect with other women, okay? As, as, as Katie, as Carolyn, and, and, and all the women, uh, Gabriella, Katie, Irene, and, and everyone suggests, okay, we're not going through this alone. Uh, in fact, 6,000 women a day enter menopause. So it's very important that you connect with other women and we have community forums on inspire.com and on responsive health at menopause. So I, next slide, I thank you very much. And I hope that you send me your questions and that I can be of help to you too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, please note that those who are tuned in live can submit questions at any time using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to address as many as we can during the panel discussion portion of the event. Next, we will have Pamela Price discuss her menopause journey and how she managed symptoms as early as in her 20s. Hi, thanks so much, um, Irene. Um, so my name is Pamela Price. I'm the deputy director at the Bomb and Gilead. And I just want to first uh, give a big kudos and a big thank you to the Society for Women's Health Research for convening this conversation and really just the work that 
you've done and continue to do in this space around uh, women's health. Um, as Irene mentioned, so I took, I had two pathways uh, at two different times in my life uh, into menopause. And so the first uh, was, yes, occurred in my 20s. Um, I was current, I was on active duty. Um, so I was a soldier in the military uh, and ended up due to some of the, actually the same symptoms that uh, Karen just mentioned, the heavy menstrual bleeding, uh, the, I mean, just chronic excruciating pelvic pain um, that lasted the majority of the month um, really, really early on. And so, um, you know, after going to the treatment, the medical treatment facility multiple, multiple times, um, I went on every type of birth control that they had accessible <laughs> uh, at that time to try and address those symptoms. Um, and because of my age, they were hesitant to give me a diagnosis of endometriosis. Um, but ultimately, uh, again, I, I kept going back. I kept really advocating for myself. I knew something was wrong, something was going on. Um, and so um, they decided to put me on a course of Lupron. Um, so Lupron is a um, hormone suppressing uh, medication. So I was, I was going through or starting to experience uh, chemically induced menopause again at the age of 20. Um, I went through three cycles, um, I believe, of that because you can only be on it for so long because of the kind of, you know, long term complications um, of it to your bone uh, density and things like that. But I went through three cycles. So each time you come off, my normal hormones would come back, then I'd have to cycle back on. And the, the, devil, <laughs> the, the devil duo uh, were definitely the two symptoms that I experienced um, really hard, uh, again, immediately upon uh, starting those injections with the hot flashes and the night sweats. Um, and I also had an experience, really, really um, hot, just irritability that almost felt like I was having an out of body. Like I was watching who my normal self is respond and react to the people that I love, respond and react to my soldiers at the time uh, that I knew was not me. Um, but I couldn't do anything. It was like I couldn't uh, control it. And that was just a real struggle. It was a struggle, not only personally, it was a struggle professionally, just because of the environment that I was in as a, a soldier, as a, a leader uh, at the time. Um, and then just also the uncertainty. Um, I was 20. Uh, I wasn't necessarily sure on childhood and motherhood, but I, I knew I didn't want those options taking a, taken away from me so early. Um, so when the conversations around a, a hysterectomy came up, um, I was adamant that I just, if, if it meant me kind of suffering <laughs> through, through chronic pelvic pain or suffering through just this kind of cyclic, um, you know, chemically induced state of menopause, I was willing to accept that versus giving up my ability to bear children. Um, ultimately where we ended up because it just the once I did those cycles of Lupron and just still um, on top of just still having uh, the, the heavy bleeding and, and chronic pelvic pain, the adhesions due to the endometriosis were just getting out of control. And so I did end up at the age of 21, I had to have a right oophorectomy. So they took my right ovary and right fallopian tube. Um, Surprisingly, later on, I found out they left parts of it and it, you know, I was still <laughs> had remnants and of course, tons of adhesions on that side. So I also ended up with surgical complications as a result of that. Um, somehow, miraculously, I was able to have my first child, my first oldest daughter when I was 22. Uh, and so that kind of, you know, was a breath of fresh air, I guess you could say, um, because I really at the time was was fearful that I was not going to be able to have children. Um, and so I uh, struggled just again to continue to find good treatments and good remedies for the endometriosis that I still had. Um, and again, just working with different GYNs, um, access to certain specialties sometimes was a challenge just because again, I was on active duty. So you have to have so many referrals um, and approvals to get to certain uh, types of care and treatment. And then also, again, just professionally, it was just a really bad time, you know, so I, you know, it was kind of, I, I grinned and, and bared it. I gutted it out, um, so to speak. I think like a lot of women do with the pain and things that we may be experiencing. Um, 
And then fast forward to um, 2018, I um, went in for my regular pap smear like I always do and uh, was uh, found to have cervical cancer. Um, by this point, I now have my oldest um, and I also have twins. Uh, and I felt like, well, my reproductive system is really attacking me. I'm not sure what I did to offend it. Uh, but, you know, kind of facing uh, this, you know, diagnosis and having a, a rough family history of cancers in general, um, I ended up at 38 um, having a total uh, hysterectomy and oophorectomy and similar to what Karen just described. So I'm 38 years old and slammed right back into menopause um, again. And even though I kind of at least had my experiences from my 20s to lean on, as a 38 year old woman, those experiences hit very differently. Um, and it, I, I, while I still had the irritability, the hot sweats and the um, uh, hot flashes and the night sweats were just unbearable. My husband would often just have to leave. <laughs> like our bed sheets would be you know, soaked. So he's sleeping in his man cave uh, many nights throughout the week. So it was very disruptive um, just to my, my daily life, to my quality um, of life. And then I also experienced um, really bad bouts of fatigue. Um, and because I have um, a bipolar disorder, I also um, ended up having to get uh, multiple medication adjustments um, to make sure that that also did not kind of spiral um, out of control. Um, and so, you know, if to kind of, again, to, to bring it, you know, full circle, um, and why I think this conversation is so important is that I really believe in the power of storytelling. Um, again, just even looking at Karen's slides and seeing the symptoms that she was experiencing early on, you know, you go and you, you're trying to get these second and third opinions. You're trying to make the best decision for you again at, at 30 or 40 or 20 um, when you feel and you hope you have so much life left to live ahead. And again, again in terms of a childbearing or having children, um, there's the kind of, you know, stigma, um, you know, that sometimes can be associated uh, with maybe having to use infertility medications if you are a woman who is experiencing these things. And again, I, I've got half of my reproductive system, which I did in order to have my twins, I had to go through IVF. Um, and so, you know, the, there's so much commonality that I think these spaces allow us to see in each other. And I think allow us to see that we're, we're not in this alone. And I think that kind of regardless of how we enter into this menopause um, space, which again, I was so happy to throw out tampons and I was happy that, you know, yes, it, it remedied and um, I've, I've been, you know, uh, cervical cancer free, um, but I was happy more than anything, I think not to have the horrible period that I had been having for a dec decades. Um, and so that was a, a relief. And then once I was able to work with my, um, you know, providers and find the right, um, you know, hormonal uh, treatments, um, working in tandem with my uh, psychologist <laughs> as well to making sure, you know, all of those in, in terms of my mental health was also doing well. Um, and so this, you know, my role here with the Bomb and Gillette and, and working and being a part of this working group um, that the Society for Women's Health Research has convened. Um, I chair um, a, a board that also is directly involved with a women's focused um, a foundation called From the Bottom Up. Um, I do uh, work on uh, work on subgroups and working groups with healthy women. So I really am invested both personally and professionally in um, really shining a light again on these pathways. I think breaking down some of the stigmas, making sure that women are educated. And then because I started so early, I am even more invested in making sure that younger women, that we really fully understand and comprehend the entire reproductive cycle of across our lifespan, that we can be prepared across our lifespan. I think that we can be the best advocates for ourselves, that we know our bodies and that we, you know, when something is wrong or it feels amiss, 
that we don't stop until we get the answers um, that we deserve, that we want, that allows us to make the best decisions that we can for ourselves and for our families. Um, and so that's really why this, um, again, this conversation is so important. The work that I do here with the Bomb and Gilead um, and the you know, subcommittees, working groups and things that I sit on, um, because I think we, we've got to do more about creating spaces like these, creating groups like Karen has with the Red Hot Mamas to destigmatize what it means uh, to live uh, with menopause. Um, and I, again, I just want to thank um, the Society for Women's Health Research for convening it today. And I look forward again, if there are any questions or anything I, else I could uh, share to contribute to the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamela, for um, sharing as well. And Carolyn, um, these stories, we use them to provide, you know, nuggets and insight and pull strength from your story to help us journey through our own paths. And so there, we really, really appreciate you coming and sharing today. Um, again, I do invite, we invite attendees to submit questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll try to address as many questions as we can in the next 10 to 15 minutes of this program, um, and especially submissions that cover recurring themes or questions that can be applied um, broadly across our audience. And so one of the, let's start with, um, we know that a regimen for, you know, managing symptoms and everything is, is very personalized, right? But you both spoke about these night sweats and, um, and hot flashes. And so um, Karen and Pamela, if you want to come on screen, I invite you to um, open up your video. So these night sweats, hot flashes, other symptoms that you had that you're experiencing, can you, they're very diverse across women, but can you give us an idea of how long did it take you to be able to establish a personal regimen that provided some level of success with managing your symptoms? Do you want me to speak first? Sure. Okay. okay, well, my again, my symptoms came on very, very abruptly. I was 40 years of age, young like, young like Pamela was, okay. And the surgical menopause really walloped me, okay. And, and, and you know, I was serving public office at the time and not remembering hardly anything and feeling so fatigued and so irritable and all that. But the, my doctor um, put me on estrogen therapy because I didn't have a uterus. I did not have to take progesterone. I took unopposed estrogen, mm -hmm. but it did take, it did take me a good six months to get onto an estrogen regimen. The, um, the amount, I had to take a larger amount initially and then got weaned down. And, uh, but the estrogen therapy proved to be very helpful for me because I recovered from my surgery and, um, and it, helped, it helped abate some of those menopausal symptoms. But it did take some trial and error to get the right formulation and the for me to take but it took it took a while and you know again you know i i have to tell you that i'm still on hormone therapy a small amount okay even though i'm much much older now and um i feel it's been very beneficial for me because i still have the hot flashes on occasion but it has protected my bones as well okay i it, it you know it does have some other effects, okay, for, for my health. So I found that estrogen therapy, you know, was, was that my doctor recommended was very beneficial to me. Um, and likewise, again, similar to, um, to Karen, because it was so, um, and, and, uh, well, let me go back. So the first time when I was 20, I, I got nothing. There, there, they, I could not be on the Lupron injections and then take something <laughs> to alleviate the symptoms. The, the, the purpose was to try and you know, stop you know, my hormonal productions across the board to again, hopefully resolve some of the symptoms. So I had to, again, just deal uh, with the hot flashes and the night sweats uh, when I was again in, in my, my 20s. Um, now, when um, you know, I was 38, had the, the hysterectomy and everything, um, then yes, like Karen, we, I went, got on, um, uh, estrogen uh, as well, but it did. I was um, 
and again, I, I was, I don't know if it was just maybe an uh, expectation. I thought it wouldn't take as long <laughs> um, as it did to start to see the symptoms to where they subsided to where I felt like um, I'm not, um, like it was at one point I would feel like, can people really see me sweating? And so there was also like an anxiety that you build up because you feel like on the inside, you know, I'm a boiler you know, in here, and you have to start to see the beads of sweat that I feel are probably more prominent on me than what they really were. But in my mind, that's how I am feeling. Um, and then same thing, like with the, the the night sweats, you can only take off so much, <laughs> not you know, or nothing. And then you're still like, why am I sweating? I've got the fan blowing, the thermostat is on 65, you know, so my kids are like, we're freezing. I'm like, grab a blanket. <laughs> um, so it's, um, you know, it's one of those that I was hoping it would have been shorter once I started the, the, the treatment, but it did. It actually took, yeah, um, around that probably six to eight months mark before I was like, okay, I think this feels okay. And then at the same time, you know, for me, we were also, um, I've got a horrible genetic kind of family history for chronic diseases. So we also wanted to just to be mindful to not predispose me to other uh, things as well with any kind of treatments we were exploring. And then also balancing, well, what was my, you know, psychologist saying, well, you know, here's how we can adjust, you know, your behavioral meds over here with your heart, you know, so it was a lot of coordination. Um, I was fortunate, unlike, unfortunately, like a lot of women aren't, um, I had access to good you know, care. Um, I had a really supportive, um, you know, husband who didn't understand, but he understood. <laughs> um, and so uh, that, you know, you know, journey again, it kind of took it in. Yeah, like, you know, Karen, I'm still, you know, on hormones. I take vitamin D uh, as well, vitamin D supplement um, as well. Um, and again, it's a, it's a, a progress. Um, like I said, I'm 42 now. So we'll see uh, when I'm 50, if, you know, again, <laughs> kind of where, where it's all stacking up. Um, but, you know, we also, so the women who just say this happens to you, maybe it's naturally occurring, it's not due to surgeries or, or chemical or things. We know that, you know, African American women, they're experiencing this, you know, this double duo a lot longer. Um, so again, thinking about how, uh, how long they may have to be on treatments in terms of, you know, um, minority women typically go through the, the process and experience the symptoms for a longer period um, of time. So, you know, I don't want to to make light of that some women don't, you know, it, while we had the immediate <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, <laughs> but we immediately were able to, you know, get to the treatment. So we didn't have to go through 10 years of <laughs> the hot flashes and everything before trying to figure out, you know, what was going on, so. Um, I, I really appreciate you saying that actually, um, as you as you mentioned the experience and there was a question that came in that you kind of touched on, the diversity of experiences when you go through a natural course of menopause, it on average can last four to seven years for some women, and some can be, you know, as long as 10 or plus years. And so during that time, your hormone levels are fluctuating and your body is essentially trying to adapt to these new levels of estrogen. And so you can have the hot flashes and the night sweats, the brain fog, kind of like, I don't understand what's going on, or you feel a little bit more forgetful. Um, there are, you know, other symptoms and conditions that are associated with menopause and that transition because of the role that estrogen plays in the, in the female body. And so um, what other, were there any other symptoms? So for example, like cardiovascular disease becomes, uh, there's a higher risk for that um, post-menopause. Um, bone health is important and osteoporosis risk increases as well. Um, diabetes or some weight gain that's associated with. And so obesity and diabetes is something to watch out for. Um, and so what about, did you experience any joint pain or anything like that? And then actually one other um, major symptom or, or complication with menopause can be genital urinary syndrome of menopause, which has um, genital, sexual, and urinary um, issues. So it might be like vaginal dryness or painful intercourse, um, urinary incontinence, urgency, having to urine, um, pee a lot or urinate, that these are also um, some health conditions or issues that women experience. 
how did you deal with that? Or did you? Um, I think there's, there's a couple of questions talked about like sexual pain in particular, the vaginal dryness or the reduced libido. So not having the same sex drive and in the season. So whereas you're not worried about getting pregnant anymore, it's like, you still want to be able to enjoy your sexual health. And so, um, um, so I, I did, um, so I was diagnosed with high blood pressure, um, within that first year. So, um, and again, I just knowing my family history there, I'm sure a lot of that was at play, but it wasn't, I think also people understanding it was not my lifestyle. I maintained, you know, a, a healthy weight. I ate, um, I didn't diet, but I, I watched, I was mindful of, of what I ate and, you know, stayed away and steer clear of those things. And literally I had had a good blood pressure record all the way up until that point. Um, so that was also something that we had to kind of take into consideration. So I kind of went from being a, a multivitamin a day type of girl to, you know, I have I feel like at one, some point I'm going to need the little daily Sunday through Saturday pill box so that I know like, oh, this is everything that I'm supposed to take. Um, because that was uh, something that happened. Um, weight gain or trying to keep and maintain weight was also something um, that I, I noticed um, uh, just in, you know, it, it, it kind of came on a little more sudden than maybe what it had before um, in, in the past. Um, so again, you, you are kind of aware of those things. Um, in, in the sex department, I had young kids. So a lot of our sexual activity had already kind of slowed up because our twins were still relatively young. Um, but I didn't, um, I was fortunate enough that I didn't experience um, any pain um, with, with intercourse, but, you know, I did kind of educate myself on, well, um, you know, were there lubricants and things like that to be safe if I felt that there was going to be, you know, or if I was having or experiencing, um, any of the, the vaginal dryness, um, which I really didn't have to any extent that it was, um, you know, disruptive to, you know, to that aspect, um, of, of my life. Um, but it was, um, I would say if anything, just that conversation, I think with your mate or with your significant other, um, and I talk about these things all the time, but sitting down at the kitchen table with my husband to say, well, you know, um, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? You know, can we have a plan? <laughs> um, you know, and just again, making sure that he kind of understood as I was, you know, again, trying to get adjustments to medication, you know, correct. Um, and so that, that I think, yeah, was, was a challenge definitely. unmute myself. Vaginal dryness is a real issue, okay? I have to tell you, and it's just not me that feels it. I, I guess, you know, I started thinking, you know that song, How Dry I Am, How Dry I Am? I started thinking about that, okay? And it's, you know, I, I didn't want to flatline sex, okay? Like, I know, because I talk to a lot of women, and they just flatline sex as a result of feeling so dry. Okay. And I didn't want to do that. So I started using lubricants. Okay. Uh, vaginal long lasting moisturizers. And then, you know, I spoke to my, my GYN about the low dose estrogen therapy. Uh, and that has helped me a lot. So, you know, but it's a real phenomenon and when many, many women just their sex life goes down like the stock market at menopause because it's so real and just stay away from me. I'd rather go shoe shopping than have sex because my vagina is dry. Okay. And that's, a, that is true. So I, I you know, I found, found that initially the lubricants and the long lasting moisturizers worked. And then it got to a point where I had to speak to my GYN about some extra help. And that has helped tremendously. You know, you both have mentioned, of course, because you were having some other health conditions that, you know, precipitated this, but what conversation do you think as you approached menopause might've been the most challenging? Kind of how did you address that? You know, was it having to say, you know, I, I'm having vaginal dryness or, you know, the brain fog, did they always understand your symptoms and have a solution for you? Or, you know, did you ever feel like your, your, your symptoms might not be taken so seriously or it's okay, it'll pass, but you're like, it's bothersome. How did you kind of approach that where it's not in my head? This is really in my body 
and I need a solution. So um, I, I like for me, I, again, I've always, I think even from just a young age, and again, part of probably just my upbringing, I, you know, if I knew that if no, if I'm not going to fight for me, who else will, um, right? So um, I was kind of that, that worst, worst patient. Like, you can't just give me a pamphlet um, and say, well, you know, good luck with it. Like, I'm going to keep coming back. I know I wore the nurses out with, you know, with telephone consults and I have a question. Well, we can't, we, there's no appointment. Okay, that's fine. I don't need to be seen, but I just need someone to respond to my question. Um, and so, you know, I think that was it for me in terms of with on the healthcare side. Um, but I think with, you know, my husband, um, you know, I took it as a teachable moment with my oldest daughter who, you know, was a teenager um, at the time. Um, and then I think in work, I think especially again, when, when the irritability comes into play, and like I said, you really just in moments feel unhinged, and I hate to use that word, but you really just feel, you know, it's the smallest little thing that has just set me off. Um, and that's really, you know, to try and navigate that in the workplace, um, I think was, was a, a huge challenge um, when you kind of take the view that I do in terms of leadership and how you treat people and, and your interactions with people, how you communicate, but that being so important. And I felt during that time that I lacked that, I, I lacked that ability to be able to, to communicate um, appropriately and effectively. And so that was a challenge. And then I eventually just got to a place where I just gave myself permission to tell people. And I would walk away or leave a conversation and I would leave it in that, I'm just not in a good space right now to continue this dialogue and this conversation. And I really would appreciate if you would give me a minute, an hour, give me a day um, to be able to respond. So I really tried to just give myself some grace and that permission to, you know, I didn't have to let everybody know everything that was going on, but to at least say, don't force yourself to be in a situation or force yourself to, you know, again, if I am really having a, a flash is written, then, you know, turn my camera off again, if, if it was a Zoom, but again, this was prior to COVID that I was, you know, dealing with this. So we were not on Zoom, we were in person at tables and I would just, you know, put up my little church finger and say, I, you know, I'm gonna step out into the hallway or the restroom, splash some water on my face or something and try until I feel like I'm composed enough to continue. And I think that can be really um, hard. And then again, um, trying to get my husband to understand something that was happening on the inside of my body that he couldn't see uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and getting him to, you know, again, and as best he could, you know, understand and, and, you know, what I was dealing with and us together as a partnership, figuring out, you know, what we, we wanted to do. One of the challenges that I also had and was, I was having so many symptoms and so embarrassed to go back to my doctor. And when I went back to my doctor, I just didn't find that there was enough time to really fully discuss everything that was going on with me. And so I held back, okay, from asking the important questions. But it, it, the time allotted with my doctor didn't lend itself enough time to fully explore what was happening to me and what I needed to do. And to give me and to prepare me to give me all the information I needed so that I could make some important decisions in my life. So the time with the doctor and the patient and then sometimes, you know, you can go to a, a clinician that really isn't, excuse me, up to snuff on menopause. Okay. And, you know, so it, it's, I find it's very important to really find a doctor that really is, is certified, knows what they're talking about menopause, can let you in, and will give you enough time to explain things in depth so that you can go home and make important health decisions on your own. But, you know, that's, that's kind of a challenge today. You, you raise a really, really good point. Um, and I think there was a, some questions about how to get a doctor and recognizing symptoms. And there are um, healthcare providers who specialize in midlife care. And so they can be very helpful or women's health specifically, if that's kind of their niche. So those are some providers that you can look out for. 
But another um, thing that we kind of touched on, it's come up in the questions and Pamela, you, it, you'd you also mentioned is the um, mood disorders and mental health and wellness. And I know we have our toolkit and we have some areas there and, you know, research has shown that, you know, there's a two and a half fold increased diagnosis of depression during the menopause transition and post-menopause. So um, there, that is a very real and present challenge that women, many women will face during their menopause transition and later in life. And so um, we are running out of time, but I do want us to be, you guys to be able to chime in if there's any words of either wisdom to advocate for yourself or something you want to do to support or some nugget that you would like to leave us with concerning um, mental health and wellness around menopause. And so I guess, um, Carolyn, if you want to, uh, Karen, sorry, if you want to start. Then Karen, yeah, sure, chat. what, what I, I found, okay, help me, okay, with, with this is to exercise, <laughs> believe it or not, because, you know, I was not exercising, I stopped at everything, but then I decided that, you know, like, maybe I needed to just get and get myself back in gear. So exercise, okay, was very important to me because it raised those endorphins, okay? And it, and it helped, helped me make me feel better about myself. And it, and it, and it really stopped, it ended my, de my depression. I, I guess I was fortunate, I didn't need antidepressants or anything at the time, but I, I just needed to get out and take a long walk or I needed to be with my friends. And, and I went, I started ice skating, believe it or not, because I was having hot flashes so much bad and I never got hot. <laughs> and I never, I never had a hot flash on the ice rink and I still skate. Okay. And that helped with my depression too. So I, I strongly advocate doing something for good for yourself. And whether it's exercise or, to, or starting to eat right properly, and that helps a lot too. Um, I would say same. And just, I think if anything, um, you know, this journey or my journey with, with menopause has really um, made me focus on me. It's, it's made me recenter. And I think again, as women, we wear so many hats, we do so many things for so many different people. Um, but this particular journey really does kind of require you to Karen's point to figure out, you know, where are your happy places um, and, and spaces um, and, and finding that time to do something that is just for you, that is not about the children, it's not about the husband, but it really is, I enjoy it and I'm just doing it because you know, it makes me happy. It puts a smile on my face. And we don't often, I think, feel we can do that. I think it, you know, we feel like we're going to let someone down. But if it was anything I would suggest, and, and it was helpful for me, um, because I already had an underlying mental health illness. So I, it was even more, um, more, I was, had to be more adamant that I had to make that time for me. Um, and that I had to be transparent, I had to be honest, I had to, you know, whatever I was feeling, um, to be able to uh, kind of acknowledge it, process it, uh, and, and whether that was through journaling, through, um, you know, I would, you know, it was a space in my house, and I, they, my husband, this is off limits, no one can go in here but your mother, and it's a small, just little closet, I've got a blanket and a pillow, and I can go in there, shut the door, and I know when no one would bother me. And so just even having that fit um, to collect yourself, to kind of recenter, I think it, that's just important, I think, in, as a general principle in life, but I think definitely for us on this menopause journey, and then definitely if you are starting to experience more of that depression or anxiety as a symptom, um, to, to take that time for sure. Thank you so much. You guys are amazing. We thank you for your time and the insight that you've shared today. Um, we also would like to thank Estellas Pharma and Pfizer for their support of this event and SWHR's menopause program. We look forward to highlighting more women's health topics for menopause preparedness. And our next series event will be on September 8th living your best work life through the menopause transition, 
featuring Pat Duckworth. She's a women's well-being and workplace menopause strategist. Uh, we will also be sending out an email with the recording of today's webinar to all registrants, as well as a link to SWHR's Menopause Preparedness Toolkit that provides additional information to help women navigate their midlife and menopausal care. The toolkit includes content about recognizing and treating menopause symptoms, preventive care for health conditions associated with menopause and midlife, talking points for your doctor's appointments, and your a personal menopause care journal. Uh, when we send out this email, we'll also be able to send out some links to other additional resources like finding a menopause practitioner and some of the, the questions that were submitted we weren't able to get to, we'll be able to give some additional resources there for, for those that um, have um, attended and address those. Uh, to all of our viewers, live and recorded, we invite you to connect with us on social media and visit our website, www.swhr.org to register for future events, download women's health resources like our menopause preparedness toolkit and sign up for our newsletter. Let's continue the important conversation with hashtag SWHR Talks Menopause. Thank you for joining us.